On behalf of the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement at Bryant University, welcome to our third webinar this spring designed to share professional expertise with members of the Bryant community. Today, we have two special guests from Amica Mutual Insurance, Amanda Dilley from the class of 2013 and Samantha McSweeney. Amica, founded in 1907 in Providence, Rhode Island, is the oldest mutual insurer of automobiles in the nation, known for superior customer service and financial stability. Both Amanda and Samantha serve as recruiters responsible for identifying and evaluating candidates for Amica's Future Leaders program. For more information, visit futureleaders.amica.com. Now, let me introduce myself. My name is Charday Hunt Jante. I am a class, I'm a member of the class of 2017 and work in the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which should last approximately for 45 minutes. Without further ado, we will begin with Post Bryant Life Part One. Take it away, Amanda and Samantha. All right, hey everyone. My name is Amanda, as Shardy mentioned. I'm a grad of Bryant University from 2013. Hi everyone, my name is Sammy McSweeney. Um, although I'm not a Bryant graduate, um, I do work here at Amica, um, and I'm excited to share some awesome um, information with you guys today. Awesome. So um, the purpose of today's webinar is really to go over some of the things that you're going to either need to know right after graduation or potentially some things that maybe you haven't run into, you know, in your couple years after graduation. Um, a lot of the information here I've learned kind of throughout my, you know, past five years after graduation and um, kind of post-grad life. So hopefully, you know, we really just want you guys to see maybe some important topics um, that you are unfamiliar with or maybe a couple tips and tricks for kind of moving forward in your life after Bryant. So um, I obviously, like I said, I've been kind of out for five years now, just um, like a lot of you, these things are maybe things that I'm not necessarily specifically familiar with. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily an expert on these things, but like I said, there's going to be um, a lot of information that you're going to learn throughout your five years, maybe through friends, through family, through hopefully this webinar. Um, and you'll be learning a lot more as you get older and, and really, really hope you can kind of just take something away from today to help you um, in maybe one of these topics like budgeting, living, um, savings, taxes, benefits, um, and maybe even some new opportunities after school, whether in your current company or in new companies, as well as staying connected to Bryant. So I'm going to kick things over to Sammy to talk a little bit about budgeting. All right, guys. So yeah, let's kick it off with budgeting here. Um, so this is an important part of both life in college and when you graduate. So um, some of you guys might be a couple of years out of college and just now really figuring out how to most effectively um, manage your budget. Um, with an income, it is really essential to make sure that you're managing your money, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know. So there are two categories that we like to think of when we're budgeting, and those are your essentials and your non-essentials. So your essentials are things that you have to pay for regularly, most likely on a monthly basis. So these things could include maybe your rent, insurance, student loans, your credit cards, um, your car, transportation, health benefits, and taxes. But then we also have our non-essentials. So these are things that are really personal to you. So what do you like to do outside of work? What are your hobbies? Where do you spend most of your money that isn't dedicated to those bills and student loans? So these things could include maybe gym memberships, your subscriptions to Spotify or Netflix, um, traveling occasionally um, for both men and women. Um, guys, you might be getting your haircut every couple of weeks, so that's something that you should factor into your budget, as well as for women maybe getting your nails done um, or your hair done once a month. Um, so these things really do add up, um, and making sure that you incorporate them into your budget is a must if you guys want to be able to manage your money, um, spend wisely, and effectively save your money for those future endeavors. Yeah. 
So once you have an idea of this salary that you're going to be making, you know, you've gotten your first job or maybe a, a new promotion or maybe even a new opportunity, you're going to start needing to determine how much you can afford on a monthly basis. So um, one of the biggest expenses we all know, right, is has to do with where you're living. So you're really going to have a couple options right after school or even sometimes changes, you know, throughout your career, kind of where you're located or what your job is going to be. Um, but you have a couple options, like potentially getting a roommate or maybe some roommates um, living alone or living at home you know if you're like me I lived with five people in my townhouse and I kind of needed a break from people so mm -hmm. I wanted to live on my own um, but you might have an opportunity where you're working really close to your you know, your parents home and you have that opportunity to save a little bit more time um, so all of these are really great options but each of them is going to have a different impact on your budget um, so if you're living at home chances are most of your living expenses are going to be paid for so if you're moving out with someone or on your own and renting, you're going to have the most to consider. So we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about um, people who either are moving out or they're kind of moving into a new situation. So first things first is to determine where you're going to be living. Whether you're in a city or a suburb, um, close to a driving commute or public transportation is something very important to consider. Um, if you're renting, you're going to have a lot of different options to live either in an apartment complex or maybe renting from a landlord, either an apartment or a home. But either way, you're really going to want to do your research on the place or the landlord or the complex. Um, so for instance, for me, I moved after school to Denver, Colorado. It was a really big move for me. I didn't have many resources in the area besides kind of what people in the office were telling me where to look and, and where to live. So um, I did not do enough research when I first got there. I realized after spending a little bit of time in my apartments that, you know, when I would do a Google review or I looked it up on apartments.com that my apartment complex didn't have very good reviews and a lot of the things that other people were complaining about were things that maybe I was running into too. So I could have avoided some of those um, you know, issues if I had looked at that review, maybe I would have lived someplace else. I also suggest driving around the area of your new place at different times of the day and night, or maybe even trying out your commute. Um, you know, things can happen very differently at seven o'clock in the morning as opposed to 10 o'clock at night. So you really want to be aware of what's going on around your apartment complex of what your, um, you know, your living situation going to be and really what your commute's going to be. You know, if you're living maybe at home in the suburbs and traveling to Boston or traveling to New York City, the train might, might be an hour long. It might be longer for some of you. So making sure that you're really comfortable with the amount of time that you're going to be spending going to and from work. So price is obviously another really important aspect of choosing where you're going to live. Um, a general rule of thumb is to send no more than a third of your monthly salary. Uh, a lot of you are probably laughing if you're either in Boston or New York City or looking to stay in those cities. Um, it's definitely going to be a little bit more difficult to stay in that budget, but you'll really just need to be aware of this kind of when you're budgeting other aspects of your life because there might be some kind of give and take that you might need to do. When looking to really secure your place, you'll want to consider any costs associated with potentially maybe a security fee, um, which is usually one month of rent, um, as well as any realtor or broker fees. Um, these can be very expensive as well, and a lot of times it's necessary to use a realtor when you're looking for a place in a bigger city. But try to negotiate with your landlord. I know there's some situations where you know our landlords they really want someone to be renting out these apartments, so um, they might be willing to pay for half of it or part of it or maybe even the whole thing if you're lucky. So um, be aware of that, um, attempting to negotiate with them. Also be aware of any lease breaking fees, especially if you're considering, you know, maybe that you're going to be leaving in six or seven months or after a couple months. Uh, some complexes or some landlords might not let you break the lease. It might be, you know, two to three months. So making sure that if you are potentially going to be breaking a lease, make sure that you have enough money saved up to do so, um, or else you might have to wait until your lease is over. Also consider what your utilities are going to be. Um, you know, it's going to change based on the seasons or really based on the, the place that you're living. You know, some older homes might not have great, um, you know, air quality. There might be, you know, it might take more to more electricity to use the air conditioner in the summer as it would for the heat in the, the winter. So sometimes you're, usually your landlord will know kind of what an average would be a month. So make sure that you're aware of that as well.
Um, and in addition, when you're actually making the move, there can potentially be a lot of costs and really logistics involved. So if you're moving at a popular time, um, I know for South Boston, where a lot of people after graduation do move to September 1st is pretty crazy. Um, so make sure that if you need to reserve a parking space or an elevator in your building or um, you know street parking, whatever it might be, make sure that you're reserving this and, and planning far ahead. Um, Boxes can be really expensive. You know, you might have some at home potentially, but a really great idea that um, I learned from someone was just to check on Craigslist on a set early Saturday morning. A lot of people who just made a move, which usually happens a lot in the summertime, they will just put a posting up and say, hey, there's a bunch of boxes at the end of my driveway. Come pick them up for free as long as you can get them yourself. So, you know, grab someone with a truck or a big car and go pick up those boxes. Maybe check a local grocery store. Um, and then also, you know, definitely get your friends involved. I know it's kind of hard to find people who really want to help you move but um, maybe you'll be able to return the favor someday in the future and and one other really important thing I think um, to remember is take pictures of where you're moving into you know if there's any prior damage or maybe it's a, a completely brand new um, you know oven or microwave you want to make sure that you're documenting you know what it looked like when you first got there so that you're not potentially on the line for some prior damage or you're able to kind of make sure that it looks like the way it did before you actually moved in. So as Amanda mentioned, um, within the first few years of graduation, you may have moved to a new place, um, maybe you bought a new car, and now you have assets that you didn't have before. So in order to protect these assets, such as your car, your home, um, your personal property, if you're just moving into an apartment, um, you need to have the right insurance coverage. So with that new car, maybe you just purchased it or maybe you're just now getting kicked off of your parents' auto insurance, but you need to get auto insurance to protect you and your vehicle. Um, this will cover you for property damage or liability in an accident, um, and it can even protect you as a pedestrian if you're hit while crossing the street. If you move into a new apartment and you bring all of your belongings with you, um, you do need coverage for that personal property. So getting renter's insurance will provide that coverage for your personal property should a loss occur inside of your apartment, um, and it also provides that liability coverage. So maybe you're a couple more years out and you've saved up enough money to purchase a home. At this point, you'd have to upgrade from a renter's policy to a full homeowner's policy. So this would protect not only your personal property and liability, but also the structure or the dwelling as well. So I know that there are a lot of questions about insurance, um, and we will be going over these more in depth in part two of our webinar series, which will be on May 9th. So we encourage you guys to attend and learn some more about some of these questions you may have. So moving on to a topic that I'm sure we all want to manage but may find difficult to do so, savings. As we've mentioned, now that you have a regular income, not only do you want to budget, but you should start saving as well. So how can we practice saving and maximize the amount that we can put away? First of all, there are different kinds of accounts that you can have through most banks and these are checking and savings accounts. So for me, I have Bank of America and I have the Bank of America app. I can log in right there and see my checking account and my savings account, which I use for different purposes. The checking accounts do not have an interest rate and are really quick to access. Um, most people use checking accounts in conjunction with their debit cards. Um, so that money can be taken right out of that account if you charge something on your debit card. Um, you may also have your paycheck direct deposit into your checking account, um, which is what I do. Um, or you may even be able to have the opportunity to have 50% go to your checking account and 50% go to your savings account. So with the savings accounts, they do have an interest rate. So annually, you may be getting a small amount gained in your account. Um, most people think of their savings account as kind of that emergency fund. So you're driving to work and unexpectedly your car breaks down and now you have to pay for those repairs. Um, any sort of unexpected life event, you know that you do have money in your savings that will be able to cover that. People also have separate accounts for different things. Um, so like I mentioned, you may have a checking account with which your direct deposit goes into and you use that to pay your bills. Um, maybe you have a separate account that you use for kind of your spending money. Um, and you might also have different savings accounts. So maybe you have one that you're putting money into um, just to save up to buy a new home. So once you've really figured out how you're using these accounts um, and what you're saving, you do need to determine what you're saving for. Um, so we like to think about it as kind of what's on your bucket list. Everyone is going to have different goals in terms of what they're really saving for. 
Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, maybe you're saving up to purchase that home. You're putting a lot of money away in your savings account to potentially um, purchase a home. Maybe you kind of want to get rid of that old junker car that you've had since high school um, and purchase a new car. For some people, their savings goals may be so that they can finally take that vacation or trip that they've been dreaming of forever. Um, or maybe they're just saving so they can travel more frequently in the future. There are also some other things that you definitely want to keep in mind in terms of savings. So debt. This is a word that I'm sure many of us are familiar with after going through college, or you will be familiar with once you graduate. So we should be cognizant of any debt that we may owe on credit cards, on student loans, um, because all of this does affect our credit score um, in addition to other things. So we talked a little bit about what kind of accounts most banks offer, um, but there are also different kinds of cards that banks offer, such as a debit card, a credit card, or a charge card. Um, so a charge card, this is something like American Express cards, um, where you charge throughout the month, but then you are required to pay off all of those charges at the end of the month. A credit card differs. Um, it's the same thing you're charging throughout the month, but you do not need to pay off the entire amount at the end of the month. However, whatever you do not pay will accrue interest in the long run, so it's important that you don't let that um, build up too much. You want to pay those off as soon as you can. Um, so what's the best one for you? It really just depends on what your goals and your needs are. Um, some cards also offer different options like a point system, cash back. Maybe you could get um, no or low interest rate for the first one to two years. Um, I studied abroad, so I had a travel rewards credit card. So all of those flights that I was buying, um, even gas stations, um, hotels, hostels, those all accrued points um, that then translated into a credit on my credit card um, to pay off other things that I had purchased. So how many cards should you have? Definitely something to be aware of, especially how many lines of credit you're opening. Um, I know for a lot of people, you go into a store um, and they ask you, do you want to per um, sign up for our store credit card? Um, definitely just be careful when you're doing that um, because it can impact your credit score, leave more room for error, and have more increased debt. So um, for us, we always suggest that you pay off in full when you can. Um, as I said, your credit card credit card score can be impacted by the amount of debt and how many cards you have. So finding tools to manage your card and check your credit score are important. So some of these, I'm sure you guys have heard of them, are TurboTax, Credit Karma, um, or FreeCreditScore.com. Most of you are probably just graduating or a couple years out, so those student loans are something to be especially attentive to after graduation. Um, definitely make sure that you have um, any documents necessary um, organized in regards to your student loans. Um, and you should be determining when your first payment is going to be due. So most graduates can defer for the first six months after graduation. Um, maybe you're attending grad school or doing another year in a program, and you can defer for that um, extra year before you're required to start paying your, off your um, loans. Um, definitely pay the ones with the highest interest first and the lowest interest last because you are accruing more money that you will owe. Um, and if you can pay more than the minimum balance on those with the highest interest rate, definitely do that and get a little bit ahead of the game. Um, and consider consolidating your student loans if you need to. Yeah, I know a lot of um, Bryant students end up doing like the MPAC program, so they're spending one more year at Bryant to, um, you know, receive their MBA or whatever it might be. Um, so you have that opportunity to defer, you know, at that time. So just make sure that you're really, you know, reviewing all the documents that you have. That's the biggest thing. I think when I graduated, I just didn't really know what was out there and, and what I owed and, and where I owed to. So, um, you know, sit down with your parents if you're not necessarily aware of that, um, you know, even five years out, I'm still kind of figuring everything out too. So it's okay to be asking questions. You know, your parents are around or probably, you know, any financial, um, you know, advisors that you might have that can help you out with that process. Definitely. So taxes. Taxes can be a very intimidating topic. Most people hate taxes. Um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm a tax expert or a CPA, um, but we did want to share with you guys some forms that you should be familiar with. Um, these are terms that you might hear during um, your tax season each year, um, which just kind of wrapped up for us in 2018. So your W-2, this is a very common one. Um, this determines how much will be withheld for taxes. Um, so what you need to consider is what you file um, dependents as. So if you claim zero dependents, you'll have more taken out throughout the year, um, but you may receive a bigger check back at the end of the year. 
Um, if you claim one or two dependents, you may get less taken out throughout the year. Um, and in the end, you receive less or you could also possibly owe money. So it's definitely something to consider. The 1095 form proves that you have health insurance. Um, 1098 proves how much student loan interest you've paid. Um, and then there are things like special deductions. So you want to make sure that you keep track of any charitable donations because you can file for these in your taxes, um, which would be especially important if you are donating to um, donating large amounts of money to any um, any nonprofit organization um, or anywhere else. So although it can be really intimidating, um, there are so many great resources to take advantage of that make taxes much, e much easier than you would think. So I know I mentioned before TurboTax and other online resources that are really easy to use, um, and sometimes they're also free. Um, you could make an appointment through H&R Block. Um, and something to discuss with your employer is um, they might have resources or discounts um, that you could use. Um, possibly if you moved, your company might pay for um, your taxes to get done. Maybe there are discounts or um, different people that you can be referred to through your employer. Um, also, just talk to your family. Um, you know, your parents could have a financial advisor, a CPA, somebody that could assist you with your taxes. Um, so definitely just explore your resources here um, and don't be intimidated intimidated by it because there are a lot of great people who are out there to assist you um, and make it a little less scary than you'd think. So keep those things in mind definitely when you're um, coming up on the tax season each year. Yeah, I know actually I'm five years out and this is the first year that I did my taxes myself, which might be kind of an embarrassing thing to say, but my employer actually um, paid for it for most of the years that, um, you know, after graduation because I lived in two different states and that was because my company relocated me. So um, I was very, very scared to do it myself, but I just downloaded TurboTax and, um, you know, you just take a picture of your W-2 and it's a lot easier, um, especially someone like me who, is scared of numbers and um, scared of kind of all those forms, it was definitely very easy. So don't be intimidated by that. So um, another aspect of budgeting that many don't think of traditionally um, is the benefits that you're receiving from a company. So a lot of these benefits that you receive are either um, you know, taken out financially out of your paychecks or maybe they're added in. So it's really important to make note of what your benefits are going to be going forward um, to be able to really determine what your monthly expenses are going to be. So the first benefit that many of us think of when they're accepting a position is vacation time. So when you're first starting out or you're transitioning to a new company, you're gonna to wanna to determine how much vacation time and really how you earn it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can earn it. Um, you know, It could potentially be that you get it all at the beginning of a calendar year or potentially an anniversary date. So I started in June and my benefits for vacation renew every June. So. Um, um, it's really important to know when your benefits are renewing. Um, also, maybe they might be accrued over time. So you might have to work, you know, a certain amount of months in order to get two vacation days. So it really just depends on how your company works. But you'll really want to understand that as well as what sick time you get. Um, really to consider and budget yourself throughout the year. You know, you don't want to go and use all of your vacation time in the first two months of getting it and then, you know, be stuck for the rest of the year. Um, if you're someone who gets sick a lot, you know, outweigh, you know, kind of figure out, you know, is this something I really need to take the day for? Because maybe you can suck it up one day because you never know when you're going to get the flu um, and maybe have to be out for five days. So really um, budget yourself wisely there. Another popular benefit that companies are offering is assistance with education expenses. So um, as Sammy mentioned, a lot of us have student loans that we're paying back. So there's a lot of companies out there that are helping us out with that. So it's really important to determine how your company offers it, um, really how much they'll commit to and what the stipulations are around it. So it might be only, you know, a certain amount. It might be only on the interest. It might be, um, you know, a certain situation where, you have to pay back any amount if you leave the company within a certain period of time. So really important to know kind of what that might be, um, you know, how that might affect you going forward. Um, Bryant has also taught us the value of a master's degree. And like I mentioned, many of us are either going back, you know, right after graduation or if you're someone who's going back a little bit um, later, maybe a couple years out, um, 
it's really important to understand, you know, if your company offers tuition reimbursement, so sometimes, you know, they might offer, um, you know, per semester or just for specific courses. I know here at Amica, we offer um, approximately 10,000 a year. Um, it used to actually have to be for, you know, certain courses that relate to your, your job, but now we've opened it up a lot. So there's a lot of things that are changing throughout the year that you'll really want to make sure that you are um, aware of, if, especially if you are looking to get your master's degree. I know a lot of us have that goal in life. Um, you also want to determine if there's any specific, um, you know, company or industry specific licensing that you have to get and whether or not your company pays for it. So there's a lot of people, um, Bryant grads that are looking for their CPA or their CFA or Series 7 or, you know, here at Amica in the insurance industry, um, it's called the CPCU. So they're all very similar things, but they the costs can really add up for exam fees, materials, um, actually just keeping the designation or maybe any societies that you're in. So check with your company to see if they'll reimburse you for it, or sometimes there's bonuses for receiving those. So make sure that you're aware of those as well. Um, retirement is one of the most traditional benefits that we don't necessarily think of right after graduation, but it's really important to start thinking about it um, at this time when we're young because it's going to be a little bit more difficult to save up for it later in life when we have a lot more um, expensive expenses. So some traditional benefits, you know, include the 401k, pension plans, maybe Roth IRAs. So it's important to understand what your company is going to offer you or and or what they're going to contribute. So for instance, here at Amiga, we have a, a great 401k program with a 6% match. So um, if you have a company that's willing to match some of your 401k um, contributions, you should at the very least be putting in the same amount that they're matching because if not, you're throwing away really free money. Um, so make sure that you're doing that. But if you can afford to put in a little bit more at this time, definitely think about doing that. Um, and then the, the biggest thing to understand is, is which benefits you're choosing and, and really um, how you're going to be taxed on them. And, and just kind of think about that and what your goals are for, you know, right now and, and for later down the road, you're either going to be taxed basically when the money goes in or when it goes out. So that's something that you're really going to want to determine um, at this point to make sure that you are really saving to the best of your ability to reach your goals. So a lot of other companies or companies are offering more non-traditional benefits or maybe kind of perks. So it's important to think about those because they may allow you to spend more elsewhere or kind of balance out what you may have to spend unwillingly. So if you're in the city and you have to pay a high rent, there might be some perks that your company is giving you. Um, relocation is a really big thing. If you have to move for a company, I know, um, you know, I've been through two moves for my company and it's that it, my company made it very easy. Um, it's not typical for a lot of companies to, to spend as much as they do um, you know, on the move. So think about that when you are making a move, you might get a company car for your position. That's gonna help you, you know, if that company is paying for the insurance or the maintenance or the gas mileage on it, that's gonna help cut a lot of costs out on a monthly basis. Um, companies are offering profit sharing, success sharing, maybe bonuses, um, maybe some potential um, travel. Sammy said, you know, a lot of you guys might be saving up for a really cool vacation. Um, well, maybe if you were really hard in your job, your job's going to offer you that, um, you know, in the form of an incentive. Um, and then there's also a lot of companies that offer discounts on different, you know, companies. I know here we offer um, discounts on, you know, rental cars and hotels and, and movie tickets and things like that. You might have sales bonus gift cards, depending on, you know, what your position is. Um, and then a lot of a pretty big trend in a lot of companies now is offering maybe groceries in the office. So offering either breakfast or lunch or snacks throughout the day. Um, you don't really think about it, but a lot of those things can add up over time. So if you are, again, paying more in one area, you might be able to save a little bit more on those kind of snacks and food that you're getting in the office as well. Yeah, definitely. So those are some of the more exciting benefits that you may get through your employer. But um, something also to consider is the different health benefits that you're getting. So by no means are Amanda and I experts on health insurance, but we do understand that there are many different options out there depending on what company you work for um, or the programs that they might have. But we just want to give you guys a brief overview of some of the terms that you can expect to hear um, on your first day or maybe during that open enrollment period that um, employers have the the, at the beginning of the year to sign up for your health insurance. So um, just to kick it off, here are some things that you might hear during that time. So a deductible. This is the dollar amount that you need to pay for medical expenses before the insurance kicks in. So this is kind of like an out-of-pocket payment. Um, a copayment is a small fee that you pay every time you visit the doctor. Um, you know, you go to sign in, they say you're, you're um, 
copayment is $25, do you want to pay that in cash right now? Um, so uh, similar to a deductible that you're paying out of your pocket for the doctor's appointment. Premium is your monthly payment for insurance coverage. So you need to make sure that you know if your employer is going to be paying for some of that premium or if you're, you have to absorb all of that yourself. A PCP is a primary care physician. So this is a family doctor um, that you need to contact before you see any other specialist. So you might not need this, but you should find out with your employer. Um, there may be discounts through your job if you're getting regular physicals. Um, so keep in mind when you're booking these, um, you know, if you need the credit or you need to have a physical by a certain date, make sure you're planning that in advance because if your company is going to offer you um, some sort of benefits for having those physicals done, you want to make sure that you have them done in time. So um, the summer tends to be a really busy time for people to book those doctor's appointments. Um, so as I mentioned, out of pocket is the most money you'll have to pay in a calendar year for reasonable and customary care. So your insurance will pick up the amounts above um, the cost above this amount. And then just something to consider. So if you have a pre-existing um, medical condition, um, include the information about maybe any allergies you have um, and your and have doctors um, that may contact insurers for information about your medical history. So just having all of that information available um, when you are looking to choose your health insurance. So as I mentioned before, um, most companies do have an open enrollment period at the beginning of the year. So this is when you're prompted to select your health insurance and benefits. Um, there are tons of different options. Um, some companies may have all of these options. Some might just have a few. So it's definitely good to do your research. Um, most companies, I would assume, are pretty good at giving out some information, booklets, pamphlets about the different kinds of um, um, programs that you can sign up for. Um, so it's important to kind of look at that. Maybe you have a pre-existing condition and you need a certain kind of um, of program that you're going to sign up for for your health benefit. So definitely take a look at all of that. So an HSA is a health savings account. Um, this is basically a bank account for your medical related expenses. So this is offered with some of the plans um, and you should check to see how much, if any money that your company contributes each year um, to your HSA and what expenses are applicable. So. Um, the plans that are provided at your work each year can be confusing, um, but reviewing and finding the best ones for your needs is really important. So with that HSA, if you wear glasses or contacts, these could be covered through your, um, through your HSA, which is a really great benefit. So the following are the most general plans that we encourage you to review for what you need. So it can be confusing, but knowing any information about your specific medical needs can help you make the best decision. So a standard HMO is a health maintenance organization. Um, your insurance company will provide you with a phone book of doctors approved by the plan who are in your network. Um, if you do visit anyone outside of this network, you may be paying um, on your own for the services. So with the standard HMO, um, it is less expensive, um, but it's also a little bit less flexible. Um, you have to contact your primary care physician every time you see a different doctor, um, and you do have to stay in that network um, of the phone book of doctors that your um, insurance company has provided. On the flip side, we have a standard POS. This is a point of service. So um, this is this is a mix between an HMO and a PPO. Um, so you still have your primary care physician to deal with before any of the in-network in doctors. Um, and you still have the option to go to any doctor outside of the network um, for an added cost. So I did just mention um, that standard PPO. So this is, um, you still receive a phone book of doctors, but if you do choose to go somewhere outside of that book of doctors that are approved by your insurance company, um, the insurance company will pay, help you pay some of that bill. So this is more expensive than the HM, standard HMO, but it's also flexible. Um, you don't have to visit your primary care physician to go to a doctor um, outside that network, and you have the flexibility to go in between each. So we had that standard HMO, the standard PPO, and then the mix between the both, which is that standard POS. So some other health insurance benefits um, might include short-term insurance, special health insurance, flex accounts, and HSAs, possibly long-term disability. Um, and then also maternity and paternity leave benefits are definitely something to take into consideration. So, you know, like I said, um, we are not experts. Um, so we suggest that once you are given your options during that open enrollment period, um, that you do really take some time to do your own research and um, figure out what really works best for you. 
Um, something also to consider for people who are just graduating maybe a couple of years out of um, college, you're kicked off your parents' health insurance at age 26 if you're still on their, um, on their health insurance. So you need to make sure you're aware of that at the beginning of the year um, because the day that you turn 26, you're no longer eligible to be on your parents' insurance. So think about that, the open enrollment period before you're going to turn 26. I think the biggest thing too with health benefits for me is that I don't necessarily think about them that many times throughout the year. So Sammy mentioned your company probably is going to provide you with a really lengthy document going into detail about all of the, the things that go into the benefits. So make sure that you're reviewing that. You're probably only gonna think about it one time a year when you have open enrollment. So basically your company is gonna ask you to choose, You know, do you wanna stay with the same benefits that you've had? Do you wanna add some? Do you wanna remove some? Um, so it's really gonna be most prominent probably like at the end of the year when you're doing that or um, when you first start a new job you're going to want to understand really what you're looking for from a health benefit standpoint. Yeah, definitely. All right, so now that we're done with those benefits, um, we talked about at the beginning of this webinar budgeting. Um, so we did want to touch on some um, budgeting tools. So overall, everything that we really talked about thus far um, comes back to managing your money and how are we going to do that. So we talked about some other resources that you can use for taxes and banking, um, but these are also some great tools for creating and maintaining a budget that works for you as well. So something that I know we're all familiar with is Excel. Um, this is a great way to manage a budget if you kind of want to do it yourself. Um, you don't have to link an account or anything like that. You would just have to keep track of what you're spending um, and be responsible for yourself to input that into your Excel spreadsheet. Um, so definitely something that you could create on your own and have to maintain on your own. Um, there are also some other um, apps out there. Um, one in particular is called Mint. Um, so with Mint, you link your bank account to um, you link your bank account to the app um, and the app really tracks everything that you're spending on um, and it breaks it down like you can see there in that pie chart, you know, 45% is going to rent and then you have groceries, your car insurance, gas, even pulls in that television and internet, your cell phone. Um, so this is great because it really shows everything that you have included um, based on what you're actually spending in real time um, on, in your accounts. For me personally, I know that I just use my Bank of America banking app um, to kind of maintain and check in on kind of what I'm spending. Um, something that they do is at the end of the year, um, when you get your statement, they do similar to Mint, a breakdown um, of everything that you spent money on, how much you spent in different areas. Um, but with that, it isn't giving you the um, maybe monthly updates or um, real time that you can go in and check and see it. Um, so just encourage you to kind of explore. If you go to the app store and type in budgeting, um, there are so, so many different resources that you can use um, and find the best one that really works for you. If you're a do-it-yourself kind of person, try out that Excel and see how that works. Maybe you have more complex um, spending habits and you're paying for a lot of different bills um, and Mint might be a better opportunity for you to, um, to look into that. Yeah. So I know we talked a lot about kind of money and, and where our money goes, but um, obviously the way we're getting our money is through a career. So, um, you know, we went to Bryant, we spent a lot of time and effort to really put ourselves in a really good position for, you know, our first job out of school. But that first job out of school doesn't always um, really fulfill what you're looking for, maybe in, in a goal or in your dream job. So there's going to be times where, you know, even one to two years out or five, 10, 15 years down the road, where you're looking for a new opportunity. So um, I encourage you to look at new opportunities in your company. You know, if you spent a lot of time at, at where you are, you know, right out of school or even, you know, a couple years um, out of school, you've spent a lot of time there. Um, you've built up your reputation. You've built a name for yourself. So there's a lot of opportunities. Maybe reach out to your HR department, reach out to your supervisor. If you're not happy with really what you're doing right now, maybe it's um, you're looking for a promotional opportunity or maybe just a completely different department, there's probably opportunities out there for you. So that's kind of my first step in, in looking for something in your company. Um, when you're looking for a new opportunity, but there's a lot of really other great ways to, you know, if you're looking to maybe break ties from that company, you're looking for something completely new. Um, a lot of those things that we actually used when we were looking for jobs in school. Um, so LinkedIn indeed are really good options. You know, you have the um, alumni network through LinkedIn, um, you know, definitely look and see, you know, who's out there in maybe industries that you're looking to break into, maybe companies that you're looking at positions in. reach out to them, especially if they're Bryant alumni 
I know for myself. And um, I would I would love to speak to someone who's you know maybe just graduating just now, or maybe someone further down their road um, looking for maybe something new in their life. You know, I had someone from my class who I didn't necessarily know reach out to me on LinkedIn and say that they were interested in working for my company and just wanted to hear about my experience. So um, a lot of alumni are going to be open to those conversations. Um, we also have alumni fire now. So if you don't have a um, account there, I definitely recommend registering for one. It um, allows you to basically choose different topics that you're open to. So it might be those mentorships or talking about career paths or, um, you know, you can post for job opportunities that maybe you're looking for or maybe you're looking to hire in your company. So that's a really good opportunity. Um, the BCC, we use that for job postings when we were in school. That's another great way to look for new positions. Um, and just networking. So, um, you know, finding those people at different um, meetings that you're going to, maybe societies that you're in, use that network. Don't be afraid to, you know, if you have someone in a different industry or a different company, don't be afraid to use them because, you know, you want to do everything on your own. Use the people that you've built up in your network. That's really what they're there for. Um, so the biggest thing when you are looking for a new opportunity is really consider everything that's a part of the offer. Um, you know, this new salary at a new position might seem really glamorous. It might seem a lot higher than what you're getting right now or it might be a really cool startup um, you know company that just looks really cool but maybe it's not the right fit for you um, make sure that you're understanding what your benefits are you know do you have the ability to work from home do you have a company car um, you know what's your health insurance and your retirement benefits what's going to happen to those things are they going to completely change do they go away make sure that you're really considering all of those things if you really are looking to maybe make a change out of the company that you're in right now so overall, the biggest thing that you can do to kind of help yourself stay successful is to stay connected to Bryant. Um, you know, through that LinkedIn um, community that I talked about, you know, reach back out to your previous professors, maybe um, alumni or faculty. Um, down the road, it could be a really mutually beneficial relationship. Um, alumni events, you're going to find those same people there, but definitely go out to those events. Maybe, um, you know, you'll meet someone that you maybe had class with that you didn't necessarily get to know and they might be your new you know best friend um, they might be a really good connection for you at work so definitely be open to those especially if you're in a new city and we have an event going on there um, reach back out to those events and, and go to them and, and really make the most of them um, another thing that I didn't really realize was um, how important it was is alumni giving so a lot of us went to school we all got um, you know sponsorships and scholarships and um, you know grants through the school and that really couldn't be possible without our alumni giving um, another really important aspect of giving is um, those rankings that go out you know when we see business uh, Bryant has been ranked number one in the business school um, those are directly correlated to what our alumni giving is so it's not necessarily the amount that we give back it's the amount of people that give back so even if you're giving five or ten dollars you're participating in that percentage of alumni that are giving back which then in turn um, you know moves Brian up in those rankings and it helps your degree become more valuable so when you are looking for new opportunities or you're telling people that you know you went to Bryant University um, they're seeing how valuable your degree is and, and you can directly correlate to that um, and just go back to campus you know I graduated five years ago and so much has changed even in the past year and two years um, it looks like a complete different campus so go back you know recruit for your company if you can op offer to, to mentor students um, you know go back and speak to um, you know professors classrooms and just talk about what your career um, you know experience has been you know go back to your you know three-year reunion five-year ten-year reunion um, make sure that you're staying connected to those people that you spent quite a bit of time with um, so really you know we all went to Bryant for a reason we can contribute a lot of our access to not only the people that we met but the experience experiences that we've had at school. So it's really important to stay as connected as possible to not really only just to give back to those people that have helped us, but help those current students to be successful, um, you know, in their life after Bryant as well. So um, that kind of concludes what we've got right now. I know Sammy mentioned that we're going to be um, doing another live webinar on May 9th at 12 p.m. We're actually going to be going over some basics of insurance, things that really Sammy and I would have no idea other than um, working at an insurance company. So there's probably a lot of people with a lot of questions out there. So we definitely encourage you to um, join us for that session. Yeah. Um, and we want to open it up to see if there's potentially any questions that we can answer. And, and we're always open 
open to um, you know you contacting us we can make sure that you have our information to reach out yeah. to and, and answer any questions that we might have definitely Great. Thank you so much, Amanda and Samantha. We have just a couple of questions for you. Um, so I'll start off with this one. You mentioned a little earlier in your presentation, great tips about moving in your first apartment. Um, if someone has very little credit history, they would need a parent or guardian, or how do they get around having someone co-sign? Yeah, so there's definitely a couple options and it really just depends on kind of the situation that you're in. Um, I know that there is an option to have your parent or a guardian kind of be your co-signer um, if you maybe have little to no credit. Um, another option is is finding a roommate who really does have good credit maybe one of your friends um or maybe someone who's you know you found on craigslist potentially you know mm -hmm. i know some people who've had really successful craigslist roommates i know it's a little bit scary i don't know if i would necessarily do it but i know a lot of people who have um so just trying to find someone who might be able to um, kind of boost your credit um but in the meantime make sure that you're helping yourself right. get your credit so making sure that you're paying your bills on time paying those student loans mm -hmm. get a credit card if you haven't gotten one already um, right. but help yourself kind of further down the road so that you aren't running into that maybe in your second third fourth apartment yeah and I think that that can also um, contribute to if you're buying a new car um, I know for me um, I have had a credit card um, but maybe my <laughs> credit score wasn't as great as say my dad so when I went to purchase my car I did have my dad sign um, with me um, which was definitely beneficial um, and kind of what um, financial plan I was able to get um, in order to, to purchase that so um, definitely nothing to be ashamed of there um, do what you have to do in terms of um, maybe having someone co-sign Perfect, thank you both. Now I have another question. Mm -hmm. This is regarding budgeting tools. Um, and you mentioned keeping an Excel sheet and using the Mint app and those great tools. Do you have any other extra suggestions for us? Yeah, so those are just very basic ones that we went through. Um, there's a lot of other apps. I know Credit Karma is free. Um, they help you really track your credit score, um, any loans that you have, maybe any debt that you have as well. Um, but even earlier, you know, I was thinking about this kind of recently for myself. Um, I need to get my um, expenses in check. Um, sometimes <laughs> I fall off the track as well. So um, I even just did a quick app search, um, you know, on the phone, and there's a lot of different apps out there. Um, just ones I'm reading right now, Fudget, which is budget planning, um, Penny, which is tracking your spending, Expense Keep, Truebill, Checkbook. Um, so there's really a lot of different options. And the biggest mm -hmm. thing is how how do you really conceptualize what your budgeting is? Right. So for me, I really like seeing a graph and seeing, okay, that section on the food and entertainment is a lot bigger than what I really <laughs> should be spending on. So um, it really just kind of depends on how um, you visualize things and really helps you keep track. So um, try yeah. a couple, you might want to try one and you don't like it, you try another one and that might be the one mm -hmm. for you. And Credit Karma is really great too. Um, they'll send you notifications like, oh, we see that you just paid off this loan, congratulations. Or um, um, looks like your credit score went up this month. So even if you're not consistently thinking about it, um, if you set up for those emails, um, it's a nice reminder sometimes that, hey, I might be doing something right here and my credit score is going up. So um, I would definitely encourage people to sign up for Credit Karma. Like Amanda said, it is free. Great. Now, can you all just share um, your contact information with us so that if any of us want to follow up with you, we can? Yeah, absolutely. So my email is just going to be the um, first initial of my first name. So A and then my last name, Dilly, D as in dog, I-L-L-E-Y at amica.com. So feel free to send me any um, emails that you might have, or if you wanted to reach out to Sammy, you can reach out to, um, it's going to be the same thing, first initial of her first name and then her last name. So S McSweeney, M C S W E E N E Y at amica.com. Definitely feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got a, a pretty big network as well, so we'd be happy to help you in any way that we can um, possible. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amanda and Samantha. Um, and on behalf of all of us at Bryant, again, I'd like to thank you for your fantastic presentation and discussion. Most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and on this presentation. Our entire webinar series archive can be found at alumniconnect.bryant.edu under the Careers tab. If you enjoyed this webinar, we'll be launching part two early May. 
please visit our website for more information. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you and have a great day.